So I'm going to give you a little bit of different bent on this. Uh, my perspective on cytoreductive radical prostatectin patients with metastatic disease. Uh, these are my same disclosures again. Uh, so objective for the next 15, 20 minutes or so is I do want to give review the, some of the retrospective data on side reduction uh, in patients with metastatic prostate cancer, as well as phase one study we completed and we reported, as well as the current clinical trial that is open right now, um, with uh, Yale being the center right now. Okay. So just give you the, the, the epidemiologic data in patients with metastatic prostate cancer. Um, so patients who present with metastatic disease, overall five-year survival is about 30%. Median survival approximately th three years. If you look at the data right now in terms of epidemiology again, uh, this translates to approximately 23,000 uh, new patients with metastatic disease in 2023. If you look at the global stage, uh, this issue of metastatic prostate cancer is a huge problem outside our country. Um, in fact, if you look at this again, this is the latest data I have in 2014, but I don't think things have changed very much out there, especially the countries that way to the uh, right of the screen there, Indonesia, let's say. Overall, majority of the patients present with metastatic prostate cancer. I also bring the, your attention to this. Um, there have been a bunch of a, a blockbuster drugs that have been introduced in the market uh, since 2000, and actually the 2004 with the docetaxel's introduction in patients with metastatic prostate cancer. So we took a look at the CR Medicare database in patients who present with the novel metastatic prostate cancer up front and what type of a uh, survival benefit they've introduced, they, they've experienced over the last two decades. And it turns out to be four months of overall survival. So in spite of all the advances we have done, all the blockbusters that we have done, we have not moved the needle very much on a population base. So to that end, I do think that there is a, a, a room for a paradigm change in terms of the way we think. Um, so I think, again, I'd like to suggest cytoradical prostatectomy as a potential option here. Um, this is actually the seminal paper that was published by Stephen Culp from the Virginia group, uh, where um, he looked at the uh, uh, patients with a metastatic uh, stage what, A through C uh, in the CR data, uh, database. And uh, what he demonstrated here is overall five-year survival. In patients who had surgery done, had the highest survival at 67%, followed by radiotherapy at 52%, and the standard of care at 22.5%. So in trying to assess this question in a scientific manner, I tried to uh, launch a trial, a trial at the Cancer in New Jersey. And the first question that the IRB asked us was, I need to prove, we need to prove that the surgery was actually safe and feasible. So to this end, I put a, a group of investigators together to launch a phase one study. That was back in around 2014 or so. Our primary hypothesis, again, was a cytoductive surgery uh, is safe and feasible. Uh, and we um, benchmarked the major complication rate using the clay within the classification of three or higher, uh, being less than 30%. This is based on the salvage radical prostatectomy data uh, that's out there. Uh, we felt that if the surgery was less complicated than the uh, uh, salvage prostatectomy, we thought that was a reasonable procedure for us to move forward with. Again, I'm indebted to uh, my colleagues, uh, Saksu Bian from Seoul National University, Shige Horie from Juntendo in Japan, and uh, Bertram Yeo from City of Hope. I'm um, getting this trial completed. Our primary endpoint, again, was that the major surgery, the major complication rate within 90 days would be safe or would be reasonable. So this is our um, phase one study. Our total cohort at the end was 32 patients. Um, our mean PSA level 75.5, so high-risk patients. Um, we did take all comers with medicine disease at that point when this trial was launched with a node positive regional disease, um, seven of the 32 patients being there, um, as well as the uh, M1B patients being, again, two-thirds of the cohort here. Um, we initially consented 36 patients um, and 32 completed surgery. Um, and again, all were done with uh, robot assistance. This is our phase one results. Um, again, it's not surprising that our overall conclusion is that surgery is feasible, but it's much more difficult operation um, because these patients have a bad disease. Uh, this is, again, a cohort of uh, or four surgeons us amongst us. Our collective experience at the time with robotic process was over 5,000 cases. And in that experience, you can see that our median OR time, our mean OR time was over four hours. Uh, median blood loss was 267 cc's, although clinically not significant. Nevertheless, it's a significantly higher blood volume, uh, blood loss uh, than our conventional or the uh, radical process that we do for a uh, low risk or the uh, localized disease. Uh, median hospital stays there. Um, I wouldn't pay a lot of attention to that because the way hospital stays done in the uh, out in Asia is a little different than us. Um, again, the uh, uh, the pathologic N1 disease that you'll see there, 20 percent. I'm sorry, 20 out of the 12 patients, 32 patients uh, had no positive disease. Overall, our conclusion is that cytoreductive radical prostate was safe. Um, our major complication rate was 6%. 
Uh, we had one ATN, we had one mortality. Um, this patient unfortunately uh, uh, passed away uh, approximately four or five days after surgery at home. Um, autopsy was not done, so the etiology is not clear, uh, but the timeline suggests that this is likely a fatal PE. Um, so as a result of that, you know, we we're not mandating that the, these patients be anticoagulated up front, uh, but now that for all patients on this trial, that we do mandate that they pay beyond anticoagulations. I think on the oncology side, this is also fascinating for us as we take a look at this. Um, we had, you know, I think based on the oncologic response, I think there are actually potentially three groups that would respond to radical prostatectomy uh, with metastatic disease. Uh, we have one group of two-thirds of the patients where the PSA became basically undetectable, less than 0 0.2. About another um, eight patients here, uh, so we got a third of the patients where PSA decreased, but it still remained detectable above 0 0.2. What was also really um, concerning was that we had one patient where PSA rose dramatically after the operation. Um, his PSA initially prior to surgery was 84. In four months, went to 1,500, and he subsequently succumbed to death, um, succumbed to disease um, six months later. Um, so at least in my mind, you know, I do question, you know, did surgery really help him? Uh, probably not. Um, so the question is in mind is that potentially is there a, some group of patients where local therapy may actually harm these patients? And again, we don't have a clear data on this. Uh, so the other thing was is that uh, in patients um, uh, with surgery, one of the uh, uh, arguments for potential is, is that the quality of life may be better in these patients. And what we reported out in this, uh, what we observed here in this uh, phase one study was is that the incontinence rate was significantly high. Uh, so we were looking at the strict definition of pad free rate, at, uh, uh, which was 50%. Um, so again, 50% of patients were had stress incontinence. Now, if you look at, you know, give a little bit of wiggle room here with the uh, one pad or less being a acceptable, then it goes up to about 85%. Well, but nevertheless, again, using the strictest definition, these patients have significant st stress urinary incontinence. Uh, that said, I do draw attention to this AOA symptom score that is there. It's not statistically significant, but there's a trend toward, I think, an actual symptom improvement in these patients. That is because these patients already present with a significant local symptoms. So two of the patients that I did radical prostatectomy in this group actually came to me with a suprapubic tube in place because of local obstruction. So in those patients, again, following radical prostatectomy, if they're too free, I think one or two paths for them may not be such a bad thing. Uh, so I think we do have to take this into account of the context of the disease. Uh, the other thing is I do, uh, what I uh, think interesting in the long-term follow-up is, is that this whole issue of uh, a long-term response, long-term durable response, and to this end, uh, there's a paper that was published in the Gold Journal uh, back in 2017 from the Memorial Group, where they did this, the combination of radical prostatectomy with systemic therapy and patients who responded favorably, they withdrew androgen deprivation therapy and how would they respond afterwards? And about 10% of them had a durable response or they didn't have to restart the systemic therapy. And that was what was observed in our trial. We had five patients whose PSA was undetectable, less than 0 0.01 after more than two years on therapy, on uh, systemic therapy with the end deprivation therapy. So uh, on discussion, because this is an interesting question for us, some of the patients are coming, they're complaining that the ADT was you know, bothering their quality of life. So after discussion, the decision was made to do switch the, the approach from a continuous uh, de end deprivation therapy to more of an intermittent approach and allowing to see what the interval would be. And in these five patients, again, um, they had a, a durable long-term response. And three of these patients in this cohort actually had an M1 disease. And they remained without progression of disease more than two years after stopping the endo deprivation therapy. And we have confirmed normalization of testosterone. And this is actually the detailed analysis of the five patients who we've stopped all systemic therapy. Uh, again, these patients had a, a metastatic disease on presentation. So of the three patients at the bottom, three, four, and five, these patients are M1Bs, uh, M1, M1A patients, uh, and their, again, testosterone level confirmed to have normalized. Uh, they also, the, the cord in this, again, in our overall analysis with a phase one study at five years is about 68% survival, which is, again, very similar to the cult paper that was published um, back in 2014. And starts trying to identify, because in my mind, again, I do not think the side reduction is for every patient. The question though is how can we start personalizing this approach? So we took those five patients who had the metastatic disease who responded well and did a RNA uh, transcriptomics uh, analysis and compared to patients again who uh, 
progressed or, or we had to maintain the, the current therapy. And what we see is, is in terms of pathway, the TNF-alpha pathway um, began to tease out here. Now we need, again, a wider, uh, bigger val uh, validation from a bigger cohort for us to do. But uh, I think there may be something to do, again, because if one of the potential mechanisms for how side reduction may work is via the immune axis, and maybe uh, this is real. Uh, but this is, again, very early analysis for us. The other thing that I say, food for thought, is, is that as I am doing, getting into this whole area of side reductions, the patients were finding me and coming to me with a whole variety of different clinical situations. So this patient came to me from Alaska uh, with a castration-resistant prostate cancer. On diagnosis, he had a Gleason 7 disease, T, uh, uh, node positive M1B prostate cancer, and he was an ADT for two years. His PSA started rising. So when he came and saw me, his PSA was 3.2 on androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, after extended discussion, uh, he underwent side reductive radical prostatectomy in September 2016. A PSA dropped to undetectable level afterwards. In 2019, decided to stop the ADT and see how he would respond. Unfortunately, PSA started to rise again. We instituted the end, end of deprivation therapy, and it remains again. PSA remains undetectable. This is now seven years out. Once he started in the cast, once it went after presenting with calcium resistant prostate cancer, but again, just one patient. So key lessons from our phase one study is, is that uh, we actually, this study was designed to go up, up to 50 patients, but after 32 patients, uh, the complication was, was not as high as we expected, so stopped uh, as after 32 patients. Uh, again, we declared that the surgery is feasible, but it is very difficult. Uh, major complication was approximately 6%. Oncologic outcome was promising, uh, and I do think that there may be three potential groups uh, that's responding to surgery. We have to figure out who these patients are. So trying to answer this question in a prospective manner, we launched a SIMCAP study uh, approximately three years ago. Our hypothesis is, is that side reduction will render the systemic therapy more effective and enhance quality of life in men with metastatic prostate cancer. In trying to address this question with uh, patients who have metastatic disease and trying to answer, uh, address or explain to them what the concept really means in some surgery, that I use that um, the, the uh, independence day movie analysis of uh, having a mothership and taking it down would make the systemic or the, uh, the systemic disease more vulnerable to the uh, systemic therapy. Um, this is again was uh, discussed before, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, so uh, again, SIMCAP is not an oligometastasis study. Um, our primary endpoints are failure-free survival and overall survival. Our primary endpoint uh, for the phase two portion is a percent failure-free survival at two years after randomization. Uh, these include PSA progression, clinical progression and imaging, which is mandated at one every year. Um, and death from prostate cancer. Uh, if we see a 30% improvement, then this study will trigger, be triggered to a phase three expansion with overall survival become the primary endpoint. But it does have a couple of correlates built into it. Inclusion criteria is in all men with metastatic prostate cancer, but the regional nodes are not eligible for these patients. Regional disease only are not eligible for these patients. Uh, the other thing is that it has to be declared surgically or resectable by the surgeon. The other thing that's different from our SIMCAT as it was developed in this trial compared to our phase one study is this. Uh, we do allow M1C patients now, so it's, you know, again, that's truly not an oligometastasis study. Uh, and the uh, public node dissection is optional. However, all the patients uh, right now are, have gone the public node dissections. Upfront in designing the study, some of the question was if patients already have metastatic disease, why would you expose the patient to public node dissections or not? And it was a difficult question to answer because we just had no data on this. Uh, there was one surgeon who was really adamant that he did not want to do no dissections in these patients. Uh, but subsequently, the site has dropped out. So, um, so all the patients are getting no dissections now for the sake of this trial. But the other thing again is, is that in, ex in, exclude in including the M1C patients, uh, uh, I had this patient that come to me from China, uh, 55 years old, Gleason 7 disease. He had already on systemic disease, or systemic therapy at the time when he presented, but he had a widely metastatic disease to the lungs. He had multiple nodules in there. So he came to my clinic, um, I'm talking with a, a medical oncologist, they did give him docetaxel and ADT. After one year, um, his lungs, uh, uh, the lung lesions resolved. So then um, after the, well then uh, what he had uh, decided to proceed at that point was radical prostatectomy. Um, and the PSA at two years after surgery remains undetectable. He was subsequently taken off of the ADT and he remained disease free at this point in time with PSA being undetectable. So again, we do not think that M1C patient necessarily should be ruled out uh, for this trial. Our trial is a, a truly a phase 2.5 study, which is a, a hybrid study. It's a one-to-one -one randomization, purely 
to best systemic therapy versus best systemic therapy plus surgery. Radiation is not part of this equation, this analysis here. Uh, it's a phase 2.5 design, it's an adaptive design that will allow a transition from phase two through phase three. Uh, our initial phase two study is looking at failure-free survival at two years after randomization. Uh, and if we see at least a 30% improvement in the failure survival in the surgery arm, then the study will switch to phase three with the overall survival become the primary endpoint. Uh, we do stratify based on six variables right now, which is geography, this is an international study, or duration of end deprivation therapy, prior to randomization, uh, clinical stage as those number of bone metastases, um, avarital use um, as in docetaxel use. Also has a, I, this, this you know, um, you know, I all argue that SIMCAP, in addition to the clinical value, also has a scientific value, I think, that cannot be uh, uh, underestimated. Because these are not typically the specimens you would get normally, because we don't operate on these patients normally, right? So the genomic landscape that is out there in metastatic prostate cancer, we don't know if that's actually drove that discussion, that disease out there, or it is because of all the therapies these patients have been exposed to at the end that has caused this or not. So whether it's a cause and effect is difficult to say. So in that context, we fully tend to leverage the tissue that's coming out of these patients to understand more about the biology of the metastatic prostate cancer. This is our study schema. Um, again, all patients with metastatic disease are eligible. We randomize them. Our initially 190 patients with 95 on each arm. Um, and then uh, to, uh, to get the uh, failure-free survival at two years. Uh, if we see a 30% improvement, we'll enroll up to an additional 670 patients with the primary endpoint being an overall survival. Right now, this is in 18 um, institutions across five countries. It has fluctuated quite a bit. It has been as high as um, 30 uh, institutions, but due to lack of accrual and the cost issues, um, some of them were removed. I also want to show, uh, I think, the comparison between our SIMCAP trial with the SWAC trial. This is some of the questions that I get all the time. Um, that our, again, our SIMCAP trial is purely focused on surgery. Uh, we do not allow for radiation in this. Um, there's, the second thing is, is that the, um, the regional nodes are not eligible for our uh, SIMCAP trial. The final thing is, I think, time point, timeline. At least we'll have a first readout from the study. are anticipated that maybe a uh, year or two that we'll be able to have some readout from the study. So right now we're occurring on schedule, although there was some delay because my transition from Rutgers Cancer into New Jersey to Yale, that we had to shut the study down because you know, I was the PI and I was running the study, basically. Uh, so at this point, we have 190, 134 patients consented, which is 71% of our target. Our expected uh, current completion, again, has moved by somewhat by year due to my transition to December 2024. The Data Safety Monitoring Committee has looked at the data uh, in August 2023. They have not seen any sort of red flag in terms of complication from surgery, and they've allowed us to move forward with the continued accrual to the study. Um, right now, the eligible uh, data in terms of the events, we have 21 events right now. The first, um, after 22 events, first fertility analysis will be done. So we'll have some prelim readout from this study uh, very, very soon. And the over event is over 30 cases right now, but it's just that we'll just have to capture the data within the first two years as study was primarily designed. Um, so to that, and again, I hope to have an initial readout pretty soon on this. Um, so again, uh, my uh, summary of this, cytoductive surgery is safely feasible. Therapeutic value is uncertain, and uh, we should have some sort of a readout from our phase two portion, and whether it should be expanded to phase three or not very soon in two to four years. Um, I do want to acknowledge you know, the colleagues here because this has not been possible without me. I have to say, the one who got this trial off the ground is Neil Patel. He's a resident that worked with me for six months. While he was in, res in laboratory rotation, research rotation, he came in and designed this trial with me uh, in doing this. Again, I have to thank the, the colleagues. Thank you. Okay.